Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Coming together, oh, one heart, one heart, one mind, one, one love. Coming together, we're coming together, we're coming together. Thank you, Stephanie Bland. That's our choir director. And uh, doing worship leading today, we're so grateful for you, Stephanie. An atheist was spending a quiet day fishing, probably on a Sunday, I'm guessing, <laughs> when suddenly his boat was attacked by the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> it could happen. <laughs> In one graceful flip, the legendary beast tossed the atheist high into the air, and then it opened its mouth to swallow the man and the boat, and as the man sailed head over heels, he cried out, Oh my God, help me! Immediately the scene froze, leaving the atheist hanging in midair. Then a booming voice came from the clouds and said, I thought you didn't believe in me. The atheist replied, Come on, God, give me a break. Two minutes ago, I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster either. <laughs> I like that one. We're going to be talking about this. Uh, next week, we conclude our series on the path of transformation on Easter Sunday. Do we believe in a spiritual reality or not? That's really the question. Now... We can also believe in what science has to offer us and in the physical reality, too. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. Just to, re to review, if you haven't been here every Sunday, we started this uh, today's fourth week. The first week was on um, the evolution of the soul, that each of us as, as spiritual beings are here to grow and evolve and become. And there's a path that requires us to transform over and over again. The second week we talked about that requires change, and change is inevitable. We have to get used to the idea of change if we're going to grow spiritually. Last week, Reverend Karen gave a beautiful talk on the transformative power of grief. I'll say more about that in a moment. I was really moved by your message. And then today we're talking about the metaphysical meaning of death and rebirth. Hmm. So after all that joy and excitement with that music, now I'm going to sit up here and talk about death. I don't know how this is going to go, but we're going to try. So, so for, you know, I, those of you who have been hearing me speak for a while, I really love a three-point sermon. So here are the points I'm going to be sharing today. There's no death. That's the first point. Spiritual reality is that we are eternal, deathless, birthless, changeless beings. My second point is there is death. You will die. <laughs> From a human perspective... This body is temporary, and it will be complete at some point. There is a death. And then the third point is that this exploration of death and rebirth is rich with meaning and mystical and mysterious. And if we can pay attention to what this idea of death is showing to us, it will help us a lot on our path. So, first point, there is no death. Why would we say this? In unity, we are, I've sometimes said that we are a Christian church with a Hindu soul. We are, we are a non-dual in our understanding of reality. We believe that we are one with God and all is one with God. There is, there is no um, uh, 
some are inside the circle of God's love and some are out. We don't believe that. We believe that there is only one presence, one power, and one life. That life is eternal. That life exists outside of space and time and form, and we are a part of it. What we teach in unity is actually that we are each, we sometimes say children of God, but maybe a more accurate expression would be that. We're an expression of God's own life. The life we live is not our own. It's the life of God. We are connected And that life is eternal. So we would say that we are birthless, deathless, changeless beings who are having a human experience of birth and death. But ultimately, our spirit knows nothing about birth or death. It only knows the magnificence of the eternal spiritual life of the one. That's who and what we are. I remember my, my first time I heard Marianne Williamson speak, this was in the 90s, early 90s, actually. I was at Uni- Unity of Dallas. And she, she, at the end of her talk, she did a Q&A. And somebody asked her about reincarnation or something like that. And, and, and she talked about this idea of eternal life. And she said, you know, years ago, centuries ago, when people would get on a ship in the old world and sail to the new world, when they went beyond the horizon, Everyone just assumed that they had fallen off the face of the earth and they would never see them again. And this was the belief. Because they could not see them, they were gone. She said it's the same thing with us. That when people die, they go beyond our sight, but they're not gone. That they're just living a different aspect of the one life. And she said, she thinks that in some generations, we'll, as, a, as a species, as a race, we'll look back and go, do you remember when people used to think they died? Isn't that silly? There's a quote that I have long attributed to Carly Simon incorrectly. She has a song, and it's, it goes like this. Life is eternal, love is immortal, and death is only a horizon, and a horizon is nothing save the limit of our sight. I've Googled it. Um, Some have attributed it to a man named Rossiter Raymond, who was a a theologian and a writer in the 19th century, but some some think it goes back earlier to the 18th century to William Penn. I don't think it matters exactly. I I just like giving proper attribution so that people get credit, but they've gone beyond our sight, so I don't think they care. (laughs) But the idea that what we call death, from a spiritual perspective, is only a horizon. That... That physical presence of, that, we, that we are currently inhabiting and expressing the spiritual life through, that will be done. But the life, the, and I talk about this when I do a memorial service, when we think about the sparkle in their eye, that certain light that when you see someone you love and they see you, you know that feeling when they light up? That light, that will never die. It will go on forever. And so that's why we teach that there is no such thing as death. If you're interested in knowing more about the mechanics of it, I'm probably not your guy. I don't have, nobody has ever called me back and says, this is what happens. Um, There, you know, there's the traditional Christian, the idea of heaven and hell. Um, We don't hold that to be the truth. We, We don't teach that. There is also the idea from the East of reincarnation. Many people in our community do feel they have some deep experience of that. I don't really have an experience, but, um, I remember one time in France, on the Atlantic coast of France, in a, in a city called La Rochelle, I was about 30, and I was maybe 35, and I was walking along the seawall. It was November. It was a cold and kind of drizzly day, and there was a curve in this old, centuries-old seawall, and I remembered thinking, I know what it looks like on the other side of that curve. And I took, went around, and it was, the coastline was exactly what I saw in my mind. I have no idea what that means. But there you go. That's all I know. (laughs) Two years ago in the summer, Reverend Howard Caesar did a beautiful three-part series called Beyond the Veil. And taking information from people who've had near-death experiences, if that's interesting to you, I would encourage you to go to YouTube or go to our website in the Media Center and watch those three talks that Howard gave. There definitely are some strong clues that what we are extends beyond this body. Okay. So we don't die, point one. I think I've, have I delivered that one? You good on that? All right. Point two, you're going to die. Let's talk about that one. This is actually one of those ways in which we, 
even though, as I said, we are a Christian tradition, we follow the teachings of Jesus, we, in many ways, we have a, a window or even a doorway open to the Eastern traditions. And in this way in particular, this idea of the oneness of all that is, this is a deeply held belief in Buddhism and Hinduism. I remember a few years ago, a friend of mine sent me an email, um, the, the Five Remembrances Sutra, which is attributed to the Buddha himself. And he taught this, he said, there are five things you must remember. One, I am of the nature to grow old, I will grow old. Two, I am of the nature to become ill, I will become ill. Three, I am of the nature to die, I will die. Four, everything I hold dear will be taken from me in this lifetime. And five, my only true possessions are my actions. I read that and I thought, that is a bummer. <laughs> what, a, what a bleak spiritual teaching. That all, yeah, it's all going, it's all just here and gone. And I, I remember just feeling like, why, why do people go to that church? You know? <laughs> But then as I, as I kind of meditated on it, as I sat with it, I was new in, in my recovery path at the time, and, and I began to discover this thing we would call impermanence. It's a deep teaching in Buddhism. And it helps us with another teaching called non-attachment. Because here's the thing. If we're looking to the stuff here on earth for our good, we will be disappointed. It's not actually a bleak or a dark teaching. What it's trying to say is that we must look beyond the form to the essence of the spiritual reality. Because every form will pass away. This is the nature of the incarnate universe. That God is eternal, spirit is eternal, but it is formless. But it reveals its nature in the form, and then the form passes away. We experience God in our relationships. We experience God by being in nature on this beautiful planet. But it's all temporary. And so we must point our faith and point our, our barometer beyond the physical to something deeper and higher and wider. I experienced the first great loss of my life when I was 12 years old and my grandmother, my paternal grandmother died, my grandma Stella. Um, we, for the most part, there were four of us cousins, my, bro my older brother and then my cousin Johnny and Lori. And then uh, about 10 years, a few years later, we had a couple of other ones born, my brother, my younger brother, and then their younger brother, David. And, but for a while, when the four of us cousins were small, um, my grandma would take us on trips and do all these wonderful things, and I, I know I was her favorite. <laughs> Just the way she loved me, I had to be her favorite. I have a feeling that my, my brother and my cousins feel the same way. That's the kind of grandma she was. Just, I could do no wrong, although sometimes I did. She, she, would, she was not afraid to give a whooping when it was needed. <laughs> but I felt so loved and seen and valued by her. And when she died when I was 12, it really rocked me. I was so sad, bereft. You know, and even though it's been an interesting spiritual journey for me too, because I know that it was time for her to go. I don't, I don't want her to be here still alive. Her time had come and completed, but I miss her, you know? I miss her presence. I miss that love, that proximity. And I have felt her sometimes. Last week, as I said, Reverend Karen Tudor gave a beautiful, beautiful talk on the transformative power of grief. Death is real. It too is temporary. It's just the way it works in this realm that everything ends, but the, the loss that we feel the pain that we feel when a beloved soul lays down their body is not meant to be passed over. We are not meant to just comfort ourselves by saying, well, they're still here, I shouldn't feel anything. It's not like that. We miss their hand. My dad died about a year and a half ago. I was uh, in Columbus, Ohio last Sunday 
I was speaking at the Center for Spiritual Living. It was their 10th anniversary. I was there for their very first service 10 years ago and was able to come back and speak to them last Sunday. That's where I was. And the family that was hosting me, this couple, we were just sitting around at dinner talking before I went to the airport Sunday night and just getting to know each other a little bit. And I, I mentioned my dad and that he had died a year and a half ago, and I just lost it. Completely surprised me. Have you ever had that experience? I wasn't feeling anything, and all of a sudden, this sadness over my dad's absence just overtook me. I must have felt safe in their kitchen to talk about it. It was his mom. That was my grandma. They were very close. I do get the sense that we have traveled lifetimes together, the three of us. Some of you may not know this, but Karen Tudor and I have been friends for several years and were prayer partners before I had the good sense to invite her to come work with us here at Unity. And when, I, when my dad, who died of Alzheimer's, when he was sick and when it became clear he was passing and after passing, she really supported me in prayer and helped me through that grief process. And I remembered that at a, we did a memorial service together at a Unity um, convention. And at the end of the service, Karen said something that really moved me. She said, and we remember, they haven't gone anywhere. They've gone everywhere. And that really touched me. And a little bit later, after my dad passed, Karen shared with me that she got an impression. You might even call it a message. And I just wanted to share it with you. Your father is a warm, large, quiet presence of love around you. He says that while he loves all of his children and family, that you are truly his son. I believe that means I'm his favorite. <laughs> he indicates that you share past lives together and that your soul reflects his own soul most beautifully and closely. He is so proud of you and loves you fully. He will continue to be your champion in the toughest field you face the recesses of your own self-judgment. Receive his love. When she shared that with me, that's probably my dad calling right now, so I'm... <laughs> I, I left my house at the little town in Oklahoma I grew up in when I was 18 and never, never lived there again. My dad always liked the fact that I was not really cut out for small town Oklahoma life. <laughs> He was my champion, he supported me, he loved that I traveled, that I liked big cities, that I had experienced all these things that, that wasn't really our family, but he, he loved that about me. But the moment I, he never, my mom often would say, you should come home more, my, my dad never did. But he would, we would talk on the phone, which we did a lot, he would always say, oh, I miss you, son. He said, I wish I could put my arms around you and just hug your neck. I don't know why it was the neck he wanted to hug, but that's what he always said. <laughs> I just want to hug your neck. And then he would say, I just want you to put your arms around yourself and just imagine that's your dad hugging you. I miss him so much. More than I can tell you. And this message that came through our own Reverend Karen Tudor reminds me that he's right here. So it's possible that we can experience death and loss and feel the deep sadness that that means, and at the same time, know that the eternal life of God, as expressed by our beloved family and friends, it goes on, and they don't go anywhere. They go everywhere, including right here. So why, why is it set up this way? We're going to get moving to the third point now, to the mystery of this thing called death and rebirth. Why, why is it like this? If we are eternal, deathless, birthless, changeless beings, why don't we just be that? Why do we have to take on form and this temporary existence called birth and life and death? Why are we doing that? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have the answer. But it must mean that there is something about the evolution of the soul, the path of transformation that is revealed to us through this thing called death, through endings and beginnings. 
We've been exploring a lot about the idea of the transformation using that little caterpillar. Every week it seems like we've been talking about that. It doesn't, doesn't work just to, to glue the, the butterfly wings on the caterpillar's body. The, the process for the, butter, the butterfly to emerge, it means the caterpillar's body must die. Not exactly, but pretty much. It dissolves, it disintegrates inside the chrysalis so that this new thing can emerge. And that's really what it's about. is that Jesus, as our way shower, came to show us that death is not the end. Today is Palm Sunday. We celebrate the triumphal entry into Jerusalem of Jesus last week here on earth in his earthly ministry. And according to tradition, he knew he was walking into his death. That this is the tradition as it comes to us, and we know what happens. There's Maundy Thursday, there's the trial, there's Good Friday, which is the crucifixion. They don't talk about Saturday much. Saturday may be that time in the chrysalis when it all dissolves before it reemerges. And then, of course, Easter Sunday. Something new. The essence the same but magnified. Limitations gone. This is the mystery. This is the power that if we pay attention to these cycles of life and birth and death and rebirth, there's something here that will transform our experience of our own lives, the lives of our beloveds, the lives of our church, the life of our nation. Life here on earth will be different if we learn the lessons. Everything here is for a moment. First Corinthians 15, verse 35, Paul writes, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come from? How foolish. What, what would you sow? What, I'm sorry, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Planting, that kind of sowing. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the whole body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives his own body, its own body. It's another way into the mystery. The next chapter of your life, something must die to make room for it an old way of thinking. There we have to plant a seed of some new possibility. When you think about, it's Passover week in the Jewish tradition, and you think about in the, 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 the story of the, the Hebrew children coming out of bondage and going towards what? The promised land. They did not take their map with them. If you remember the story, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before they could enter into the new vision of what was being calling to their soul. Many of you may not know this, if you're not a Bible guy like me, but none of the original generation makes it into Canaan. None. The people who were born in captivity do not enter into the promised land. What this is showing us metaphysically is that the vision that God is giving you for your life that is transformative, that is powerful, that makes you useful to us all in a way that you haven't even been able to imagine so far, that idea, the person who, gets the, who catches the glimpse of the vision is not the person who will manifest it. The old way of thinking must die, must be disintegrated so that the new you can reveal. And let me, here's, the, here's, here's really the tough part. It's a deep teaching today, I'm sorry. The pain that you're going through in this disintegration process is what shapes you into being the person that can hold and carry that vision. You are being formed anew if you're willing, if you're willing. Just breathe. Something is happening here. 
Yesterday we had a, a class with Cindy Wigglesworth. She taught us about spiritual and emotional intelligence. We ended by breaking into groups of five to talk about tough issues in our world. And it was a particular format called Living Room Conversations where we didn't contradict each other, we just spoke our truth. And we had difference of opinions. My group, we talked about immigration and refugees, and we had people who had diametrically opposed viewpoints. And yet, we didn't fight, nobody won. What happened was we had this idea and this idea and a third thing emerged. What is needed now in our world and in our church are visionaries. We need you. But the old ideas won't get us there. I am so honored to serve as your minister at this amazing time of transformation in our church. Something is being born here anew, and we're doing it together. You're amazing. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.